Hey dudes, my name's Blako. Usually I'm working on my upcoming RPG brawler game, X Versa, but these past few weeks I've been working on a little side project. You see, last year I released a game on Steam called Kuro. It was a real-time, text-adventure horror game in which you fight monsters by typing commands and your character reacts in real time. So for example, if you type the walk right command, then your character would start walking to the right. You had to time your movements and attacks with the different weapons to make it through the dungeon. I developed Kiro with an old school art style. It was mostly two colors, red and black, to emulate old school games that didn't have many colors to work with. Kinda like the original Game Boy, or even the not super successful Virtual Boy. I also wanted to give it a D&D feel, so I gave it a narrator that was sorta of like a dungeon master. But while I worked on the game, I always sorta of had this thought in the back of my mind. What if I could actually make this game run on some kind of old school system? Like what it was designed to emulate the look of. So that's what I did, and I chose the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 was an 8-bit home computer released back in 1982. In the same year, the film E.T. was released, Michael Jackson's Thriller came out, and over in Japan, they just released this little guy, the 500 yen coin. Over its lifespan, it had a number of different games released for it. Games like IK Plus, Turrican, Paradroid, and many others. Unlike games of today, where there's essentially no limits for styling the game, some of them even looking just like real life, the limitations of 8-bit systems create what we now just think of as an 8-bit style. So, what were some of the limitations of the Commodore 64? Well, first of all, the resolution of the screen was 320 by 200 pixels, and it ran at about 50 FPS for the PAL version. So if we compare that to a 1080p monitor, then this is how big it would look. And here's what it looked like on a 4K monitor. As far as colors go, the Commodore 64 could produce a whopping 16 colors, and here they all are. The CPU was the MOS Technology 6510, clocked at a blazing 0.985 MHz for the PAL version. It's not really directly comparable, but just for reference, most CPUs nowadays are clocked around 3.6 GHz, which is only about 3,654 times the Commodore 64's clock speed. Also, the Commodore 64 had around 65 kilobytes of RAM. Usually, most computers now have about 8 to 16 gigabytes. Like the clock speed of the CPU, it's not really directly comparable, but that's like 246,000 times more RAM available. In fact, this cat picture takes up more memory than the Commodore 64 even has. Alright, so the Commodore 64 has limitations. That's cool, everything has limitations, except when they don't. But how do you go about making a game that would actually run on the Commodore 64? Well, to do that, I'm going to assume you already know at least a little bit about programming languages. There are high-level languages, low-level compiled languages, assembly languages, and then actual machine instructions. Essentially, the goal is to write something in a language that you understand, and eventually it gets translated down into a language the machine understands. The programming language. I can't understand your programming language. And in this case, the machine is the MOS Technology 6510 that I talked about earlier. Out of the box, the Commodore 64 supports assembly language and BASIC. You can just load up the Commodore 64, type BASIC code, and run it, so that's pretty neat. In fact, there were manuals with code for simple games that you could type out and run on the Commodore 64. My favorite modern language is C++, but that didn't even exist until three years after the Commodore 64 was made. However, the next best thing for me would be C, since it looks pretty similar, and luckily there's a C compiler for the Commodore 64, called CC65. So that's great. That means I can write C code and translate it into the language the Commodore 64 understands. Some people would probably say you should just write assembly code, but it's my game and I can do what I want. Okay. So I have the language that I was going to use, but how do I actually display something on the Commodore 64? Well, the Commodore 64 has different modes for graphics display. It can be in text mode, where it can display text in a set grid on the screen, or it can be switched into bitmap mode, 
where you can draw images the size of the screen resolution. A lot of my game is sort of centered around text commands, and the narrator also writes out text when certain things happen. So I decided to keep the Commodore 64 in text mode throughout my game. This meant that I could write text characters on the screen in a set grid that is 40 by 25 characters. So essentially, I use text characters to draw the background of my game and create the letterbox borders where the text command inputs happen and the narrator talks. Alright, so I could draw the background of my game, but what about the player and all the enemies and stuff? Well, to display those little dudes, I had to use sprites. The Commodore 64 has a graphics chip called the VIC-2. If you compare it to a modern PC, it's basically the graphics card, except you can't swap it out and you can't do as many things with it. If you want to render things on the screen, then you have to talk to the VIC-2 chip. So what's a sprite? Well, it's basically an image that you display on the screen. For the Commodore 64, sprites can only be a set size. 24 by 21 pixels. Also, they can only be one color unless you put the sprite into multicolor mode, but that halves the resolution of the sprite. If you want bigger sprites, you can put the sprite in double resolution mode, so your sprite will be rendered at 48 by 42 pixels. And with that, we're ready to- oh wait, also I forgot to mention that you can only render eight sprites on the screen at a time. Okay, technically there are some ways to increase that number, but not by much, and it can get complicated to do. Anyway, yeah, so we're ready to display some sprites, but what kind of image does the Commodore 64 support? Well, the easiest way to display an image as a sprite is to just use the raw bytes, because the Commodore 64 doesn't understand things like .png and .jpg. To load a sprite, you literally have to write the bytes into a block of memory, and then point the VIC-2 chip to that block of memory for it to render it as a sprite. So how I made all my sprites was to just create an image where each pixel is one bit, and then I wrote a Python script to convert all the bits into a byte array. So in my code, all my sprites were a variable that looks like a byte array. That sounds a little complicated, and it kind of was. But whatever, it works. Also, to avoid all of that, uh, you could have just used this image editor built to generate image byte arrays for Commodore 64. Okay. Well, I could display sprites, and I had backgrounds and stuff, but what about that sweet audio? What's a game without sound effects and little tunes? Well, the Commodore 64 has another chip, called the SID, or Sound Interface Device. To make any sound come out, you have to send commands to this little chip. To send these commands, like the VIC-2 graphics chip, you have to write commands to specific memory addresses, or registers. The SID supports three voices, or oscillators. So in basic terms, you could output three sound signals at the same time. If you're familiar with making MIDI music and stuff like Ableton, FL Studio, or Pro Tools, then it's not so bad to generate music for the SID, since there's a chart available for all the specific MIDI notes, and then you control all the extra stuff like waveforms and whatnot. The harder part is to actually play what you want to play in time, and then also since you're limited on memory, you probably aren't going to shove in 10 hours of lo-fi hip-hop beats to chill and study to in your game. Sweet, so we have backgrounds, sprites, audio, it all comes together so easy. Oh wait, I mean, I did have some problems, memory. I'm not going to go into too many details, memory, but what was my biggest problem, memory? Hmm, well if you guess memory, then congratulations. Having sprite animations means I had multiple images per sprite and it kind of all added up to quite a bit of memory for the Commodore 64. And when you run out of memory running programs, it kind of just does completely random things. In fact, sometimes my sprites just look like missing now. But in the end, I finally settled all those issues, and so here it is, Kiro for the Commodore 64.
Honestly, I'm pretty proud of the final result. I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one copy of my original Steam version of Kiro. For one thing, the dungeon didn't end up being as big, and there isn't fancy shadows and whatnot. But working with all the limitations of the Commodore 64, I feel like this game pretty accurately captures the essence of the original. I had a lot of fun working on this project. It's definitely a breath of fresh air to get out of the realm of working in today's fancy game engines that do a whole lot of magic for you behind the scenes. Writing this game purely with just C code and working directly with the hardware chips kind of just sparked that love I have for creating games again. And I definitely recommend other game developers who feel kind of burnt out using the cutting edge stuff to take a little time and write a little side project in something that sets so many limitations that you have to make something simple. I'd love to do something like this again at some point. If you have suggestions of a retro console or old system that you'd like to see me try to create something on in the future, let me know in the comments. You can download the Commodore 64 version of Kuro from my Patreon for free. There is also instructions on how to run the game using an emulator, with the links in the description. Of course, the Steam version is also on Steam, so you can check that out as well. Anyway, have a good one dudes. See ya!